Good morning, Freedom Church. Visitors, just want to take a second again and welcome you. My name is Clint, the lead pastor, one of the elders. I do most of the preaching and teaching, uh, but uh, you hear me say one of the elders, like Josh did. I'm one of the guys that leads the church. We think it foolish uh, for one man to run the show, unless that man, his name is Christ. Uh, we see in the scriptures that God has given a plurality of leaders to lead his church uh, to balance out gifts and strengths and weaknesses uh, that the church might be healthy. And so again, I do most of the preaching and teaching, uh, but I'm just one of the guys uh, that leads this church. If you've got your Bibles, flip to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19, we're continuing a series called The King and His Kingdom, Following Jesus Together. And, uh, and throughout the series, we've been going in for about two, uh, almost two years, um, and we'll be in it for a little bit longer Jan, I'm a little bit loud up, up here to me, so if you can turn me down a little bit. We'll be going in for a little bit longer um, on Matthew. I'd hope to finish it up this fall, uh, but we thought it'd be better to slow down, uh, not take massive chunks such that the sermons would be um, several days long. Um, break them down a little shorter uh, so that you guys could you know, go home by 5 or 6 o'clock in the evening at least um, and, uh, and be in Matthew a little bit longer. So we'll probably be in Matthew to about February before we finally finish up. But one of the things, one of the great themes even in this title of the series, The King and His Kingdom Following Jesus Together, that we've covered over and over and over uh, is that a Christian fundamentally is a disciple. So when we just look at what is a Christian according to the Bible, it's a person who follows Jesus. And a follower of Jesus is called a disciple. And so as we've gone through this, we've looked at, there's not a, like two categories. There's Christians who pray to prayer, and then there's those who are real serious, you know, and they follow Jesus. According to the scriptures, there's just one category. A follower of Jesus is a Christian, is a disciple. That's all one thing. And then what a church is, is a group of disciples who are following Jesus together. So that's what this series has been, the King this kingdom following Jesus together. Now this morning, we're picking up uh, in Matthew chapter 19. Um, and at some level, it's kind of part two to last week. Steve, do you have the PowerPoint? We good, beautiful, yeah. Um, so it's kind of part two to last week, um, where we were at with the rich young ruler. And so I'm going to fill in some... some uh, Dots, connect some dots for those who might be visitors, be new this, this morning with us as we go. But let me pray one more time and, uh, and we'll jump in. Father God, we come to you now in the name of Christ and by the power of the Spirit, asking would you send your Spirit to open our eyes. The Spirit dwells inside of your people. So Spirit, we know that you are already here, but we ask that you would move in power to open up our eyes, the eyes of our hearts and our minds, that we might hear and understand your word. God, we thank you that you're a God who has spoken to us. We don't have to wonder what it is you want. We don't have to wonder what your heart is like, what's on your mind. You've spoken to us through your spirit, penned it in the scriptures, and now speak to us through the scriptures. And so Spirit, we pray you'd be pleased to show us Christ in your word. Help us not just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. So move in power, prepare our hearts, speak to us now in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. David Livingston, missionary hero to Africa. Uh, he, came, he left from England uh, to take the gospel to some remote parts of Africa in the 1800s. And on speaking to some students in Cambridge... So he addressed some students at Cambridge before he goes and is talking about this. He had been doing missionary journeys, so he speaks to some students. And he's talking about the sacrifice that it takes to take the gospel forward. And they'd ask him, like, just tell us about these sacrifices you're making. I want to begin with reading this quote for him on what he responded in those questions. For my own part, I have never ceased to rejoice that God has appointed me to such an office. People talk of the sacrifice I've made in spending so much of my life in Africa. Is that a sacrifice which brings its own blessed reward in healthful activity, the consciousness of doing good, peace of mind, and a bright hope of a glorious destiny hereafter? Away with the word in such a view and with such a thought. It is emphatically no sacrifice. Say rather, it is a privilege. Anxiety, sickness, suffering, or danger, now and then with a foregoing of the common conveniences and charities of this life, may make us pause and cause the spirit to waver and the soul to sink. But let this only be for a moment. All these are nothing when compared with the glory which shall be revealed and for us, in and for us. I never made a sacrifice. I never made a sacrifice. How could Livingston make this statement? Now, if you sold all that you had, literally today, if the Lord Jesus grabbed a hold of you, called you right now, told you to sell everything you have, leave family members behind, move to a remote part of the world to take the gospel such that you might not have any of the conveniences you're used to, could you get there and say, I made not one sacrifice? 
This is what he says. How does he make this statement? I did not, I never made a sacrifice. How did Livingston make this statement? He ended up dying a martyr's death. He suffered greatly for the cause of Christ and says, I never made a sacrifice. How could he make this statement? Well, because he understood and lived out the passage and the truths therein that we'll read today. So we're going to come to a text of scripture where Peter asked the Lord Jesus, hey, wait a minute. So the rich young ruler, we'll see, he went away, but we've followed you. What's our reward? And we're going to see some interactions in a statement between the Lord Jesus and then his disciples who tells you, this is what you get when you follow me. And Livingston understood this. When I get the promises that the Messiah gives to his followers, when I bank wholly on his grace, you can then make the statement, I never made a sacrifice. Because when I get Christ, I get that which is greater than anything I could ever lose. And this is what David Livingston understood and enjoyed. So main point this morning, though one must be willing to leave everything behind. So to be a Christian, you must be willing to leave everything behind. Jesus promises that the grace that lies ahead is immeasurably greater than anything left behind. So though you must be willing to leave everything behind, Jesus promises his followers the grace that lies ahead of you is immeasurably greater than anything you could leave behind. And so there's going to be great encouragement uh, in this. I'm going to give you two exhortations. So first, bask in his promises, and then secondly, bank on his grace. So this is a little bit, I told Rachel, it's a little bit of an awkward text as I studied this week. You're going through the commentaries. There's some things that are a little bit confusing and, and wrestling within the text. And it's a little bit of an emotional, like you don't know how to respond because this first part really is, we're just going to bask in his promises. My hope is just to shower you with truth from Scripture that makes you stand in awe of the promises of God to his followers. Yet in it, Jesus gives us this little gentle rebuke that we need not think or be careful, be, be warned that we think somehow we earned those promises. And so again, we're going to bask in his promises, but we're going to do so in a way that makes sure, makes sure we bank on his grace. So if you want a title for the sermon, Grace Upon Grace. Now, Matthew chapter 19, we're going to pick up this week. First point, again, bask in his promises. If, if you've got uh, your Bible open, just flip to um, Matthew 19 and verse 16. I'm going to summarize for you where we were at last week so you can understand the interaction we jump into. We pick up this week right after the rich young ruler who had walked away from Jesus said, You remember the, the guys, remember the interaction? It was a good man who goes up to Jesus, whom he called a good teacher. And then he asked that good teacher, What good deed must I do to inherit eternal life? So this good man, remember we talked about, this is the kind of dude you want your daughter to bring home. Moral, upstanding, has obeyed the law, he's rich, he's successful, he's climbed the ladder, he's a good dude, yet nobody could bring any charges. So this good man walks up to Jesus and says, hey, good teacher, what good deed must I do to inherit eternal life? And so he comes and has this interaction. And Jesus responds to him by saying, wait a minute, why are you asking me about what is good? There is only one whom is good, as Josh talked about in the scripture reading this morning. So you come up to me asking about what, good, what is good. There is only one whom is good, which is God. But I'm going to play along with your logic. Jesus is going to go along with his logic. And he's going to expose all kind of brokenness in this good man. And so he says, what must I do? And Jesus goes along with the man's kind of arrogant ignorance. Remember that phrase we talked about? So the man's arrogant, though he's ignorant of his arrogance. So he doesn't know that he's a lawbreaker. He thinks he's a good guy. So he's ignorant of that arrogance, but Jesus goes along with him, and he says, if you would enter life, keep the commandments. And the rich young man says, well, which ones? All right, Jesus, if I'm supposed to keep the commandments and that's how I get to heaven, which ones? And Jesus quotes for him the sixth commandment, seventh commandment, eighth commandment, ninth commandment, then goes back to the fifth commandment and then summarizes with Leviticus 19.18, which says, you should love your neighbor as yourself. So he says, no adultery, no divorce, no lying, no false witness, honor your father and mother. And love your neighbors yourself. And so he summarizes basically the second Decalogue or the second tablet of the Ten Commandments. It says, what, is, what obedience to God looks like is loving your neighbor. And what this guy does in his ignorant arrogance is say, all these I have kept. So he says, I've done all those. I haven't committed adultery. Haven't murdered. I'm a good person. I've done all these. And then he asked this question that is so penetrating, particularly for the good old boy in the South in small town USA. And he says, what do I still lack? What does I still lack? Because he knows I've done all the rules. I've, I've obeyed all the things I'm supposed to obey on the outside. But what is it do I still lack? Is there some massive good deed I'm supposed to obey that will make me know I've actually earned my way into heaven? 
And then Jesus does something that exposes. Not only have you broken the second tablet of the law, the Decalogue, of not loving your neighbor as yourself, but you also have broken the first commandment. There shall have no other gods before me. You've shattered all ten commandments. And how does he do this? Jesus says to the rich young ruler, the rich young man, all right, if you'd be perfect, if you'd not be lacking anything, go sell all that you possess, give to the poor, then you'll have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. And we see and find out this rich young man walks away sad because he had great possessions. And so Jesus asks this question and exposes, not only do you not love your neighbors yourself, because look at all these poor people. If you love them like you loved yourself, you would sell everything and give to them. But you won't do that because you love yourself, number one. Not only do you not love them, you don't love me with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. Because you're going to walk away from the God of the universe because your God is not Christ, but your God is cash. And so he asks this question. He has this moment with this rich young ruler who's a good guy, and he walks away sad, which is an act of worship. It's a worship of his possessions. It's a worship of his treasure and a rejection of Christ. And the disciples are standing there, and Jesus looks at them, and he says, just let me tell you something. It'll be harder for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to get in the kingdom of God. So it'd be easier to get an elephant through the little hole on the needle than for a rich person who thinks he can provide for himself and take care of himself and is in himself a good guy to get to heaven. And the disciples are sitting there like, okay, wait a minute. This was the guy every dad wants their daughter to bring home. If he can't go to heaven, who can? If this guy can't get in, he's got it all together. He's wealthy, he's successful, he looks good on the outside, he hasn't done any big bad things. If he can't go to heaven, who can? If the rich guy can't get in, what hope does the poor guy have? And Jesus looked at his disciples and said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So Jesus exposed in this moment to his disciples, no man can get himself to heaven. No man has the resources in and of himself to get himself to heaven, but God has the resources in and of Christ to get any sinner to heaven. The greatest and worst of sinners can get there through Christ, but the best of sinners cannot get there without Christ. And so that's the moment that we come out of. And so the the disciples are standing there, and now Peter is going to speak up because he's thinking, wait a minute, I just saw the rich guy, the good guy, walk away sad. But we're still following you. Like, Jesus, we're here. Like, we're with you right now. And so you can imagine this moment that now we tap into. Where we're at in verse 27, Peter speaks up. Then Peter said in reply, See, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Now here comes Peter, the spokesperson for the disciples, right? That brother's always opening his mouth and inserting foot. That's just what Peter does. And so all the people that are extroverted and loud and obnoxious like Peter, enjoy this because you realize that's me. And this is what he does. So he immediately says, well, hold up, Jesus. Like, look, yo, like we're still here. Like they all left. He left sad. We're standing here. Like, I don't know if you remember or not, but we were fishermen. Like we had a nice job. We had a good career. We We had some good catches, making some sales. And you walked up talking about follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. And we followed. We left family. We left careers. Don't you remember Matthew was a tax collector? He was making bank. Like, sure, he was hated by everybody, but he had a bunch of cash. And he left it all behind and followed you. Jesus, what what about us? So I understand he walked away sad, and I understand now it's impossible. But what about us? What do we get for those of us who are following you? What then will we have? Do you see the great irony in this question? The rich young man walked up to Jesus saying, what good deed must I do to inherit eternal life? So what is it that I can merit based on good things that I have done? That's how that first interaction starts. And now Peter's asking, hey, what, what have we merited by the fact that we stayed around? So the rich young ruler comes up and says, hey, how do we earn our way in heaven? Jesus, or Peter is like, hey, hey, what have we earned since we stayed around? Like even disciples of Jesus who stick with him can be so deceived by what you think you're earning that just after this interaction, when you've just heard it's impossible for you to do anything, and we looked at children are the example. A child can do nothing to enter the kingdom. And Jesus says, that's the example, childlike faith. And Peter says, hey, but look, 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 Jesus, we stuck by you. What do we get? What, what, what What comes for us? Again, even as followers of Jesus, we have the tendency to think in terms of merit. 
Now, Jesus is going to tell a parable after this interaction, and it's going to be, again, a subtle rebuke to this very question, to this reality that, that, uh, that there's still in us something that thinks we've contributed and we've earned something. And this parable is going to show us we didn't earn anything that we've been given. Jesus did. We earn nothing as Christians. Jesus earned it all, 100%. It's not like he earned 98%, you got your 2%. Jesus earned all of it. And that's what he'll show in this parable in just a second. But before we jump into the parable and those answers, I want to make a, a quick observation that's very countercultural and, and ve- very counterintuitive. It's the opposite of what we think as Americans. And I think as many churches, churches get this wrong. Notice, I want you to look, followers look like losers. Followers look like losers. Just think of the contrast at this moment. The rich young ruler looks like a winner. He's brilliant. He's got money. He's a good dude. The disciples are homeless and following around a homeless rabbi who's going to go be crucified as a criminal. They look like losers. They don't look like winners in this moment. The followers of Jesus will look foolish. This is often the way it is in Christianity. Followers of God look like losers now. For now. We look like losers for now. Because we're unwilling to participate in wickedness for worldly gain. We don't live for the almighty dollar. We don't live for the approval of man. So we don't do things that make us climb ladders to impress people who don't love Christ. And so we look like losers, those who are out of our minds. Because, think, I mean, just think, do you ever think about, as Christians, what we live for and what we believe? We are anticipating a once dead guy who we believed raised from being a rotting corpse to come back riding a horse in the sky. This is what we believe. We are losers in the world. Makes no sense to non-Christians. Foolishness, Paul would say in 1 Corinthians. What we believe is absolutely moronic to the mind who doesn't know Christ. It makes no sense. Followers of Christ in this life are and can appear to be losers for now. This is why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 19, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all pity most, or most, sorry, we are of all people most to be pitied. So Paul says, if you're a Christian, you only have hope in this life and not the next one, we're the most to be pitied. We are foolish. Again, followers look like losers in this life, but only in this life and only for a time. But in Christ, we don't have hope in this life only. So Christ did resurrect. He is coming back on a horse in the sky. That is going to happen. That's going down. So, that, that's good. so we do have hope more than this life in Christ. So let's look at a few just breathtaking promises Jesus makes to his followers. And I just, my, my prayer even now, I just beg that God would help us bask in these promises. If we'll slow down, we're, we're always in a hurry. We're always on the phone, checking text, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, what's going on. Sorry, apparently I got fussed at yesterday for posting too many Insta pics. Overgram, I think Rachel called it overgramming. I apologize for overgramming yesterday. We had a good time with the kids. Roger, and thanks for the tickets to the game. So we, had, like, we, we get so in a hurry. There's so many things going on. We can't slow down and bask in the promises of Christ. Look at verse 28. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, or throne of glory, translated literally, throne of, when Jesus is sitting on the throne of his glory in the new world, you who have followed me. Now notice again, this is what we've seen through Matthew. He doesn't say, you who have asked Jesus into your heart. He says, you who have followed me. The person who actually becomes a Christian, and that might happen when you ask Jesus into your heart. Namely, you repent of your sin and you trust in Christ. But when that happens, you surrender to the lordship of Christ. You now follow him. So if you ask Jesus into your heart, but you never follow Jesus, what happened back there? You should not be confident was you became a Christian. When you become a Christian, that means you're a follower of Jesus, you're a disciple. So you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. I want to give you just four as we go down through this. Four promises that I want you to bask in. First promise, you will live in a new world where Jesus is seated on the throne. If you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Christ, you will live in a new world where Jesus is seated on the throne. That is coming. So brother or sister, the suffering you are going through right now is not forever. It will end. Your pain, your difficulty that you're going through is only temporary. One day it will end. 
And no more will you suffer the way you're suffering. You are going to a new home where Christ is seated, where there's no pain, there's no fear, there's no death, there's no crying, there's no tears, there's no brokenness, there's no sin, there's no looking and finding out another situation on the news that makes you weep. None of that. There's a new home you're going to. This is not home. But there's a new home you're going to where Jesus is seated on the throne. Your future is bright. Christian, your future is bright. I'm not talking about five years from now. I'm talking about 5,782 years from now. Your future is bright. You're going to that place, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2. God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Raised us up. Listen where you're seated. Raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Why did he do this? When you became a Christian, you were raised up, seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Why? Why did God do this? So that in the coming ages, 5,000 years from now, so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. It will take an eternity for God to display the riches of his grace and kindness toward those in Christ. An infinite amount of time for him to show an infinite amount of grace to his people. It will never stop. So what suffering you're going through is only temporary. If you're in Christ, bask in the promise that you have a new home where Christ is seated on the throne. And that's where you'll be forever. And it will take forever for you to get all of his kindness richly poured out on you. That's good news. This is good news. He will never stop lavishing the riches of his grace on his people. Never. He's got too much to pour out to ever stop. Second promise. <clears throat> you will rule with the king. I'm going to need to clarify that. So good Bible students, calm down. We'll get there. You will rule with the king. So he goes on. You will sit on the 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, obviously, this promise is to the disciples, not to us. This is to the apostles, right? So speaking to his apostles, he tells them, you will sit on the 12 thrones ruling over the 12 tribes of Israel. Now there's no parallel of this in Mark, and there's only a vague one in Luke chapter 22, 28 to 30. It reads this, Jesus, uh, after Lord's Supper, you are those who have stayed with me in my trials. I assign to you as my Father assigned to me a kingdom that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on the thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, there's some debate on to what these verses mean. What does it mean that the apostles, minus Judas, insert the other? So these 12, what does it mean that they're going to rule over the 12 tribes of of Israel? This, This word rule or judge and rule are interchangeable. What does it mean? What is he saying to them? Now, we know that the New Testament teaches there's a coming judgment at the end of the world. But normally in the New Testament, we read and find out about that coming judgment. It's the father and son who's doing the judging. So it's Revelation 19 when, when Christ shows up. And starts smashing people who have rejected him. And brings forth a nasty judgment that is coming. We read about that, but again, we hear usually the father and the son bringing judgment. But right here, there's some kind of judgment that clearly these disciples, the apostles, are going to sit on the throne and bring to Israel. I agree with Carson that this will presumably be for Israel's general rejection of Jesus as Messiah. That these 12 will sit on the throne and judge Israel for their general rejection of Jesus as Messiah. So again, there's some complexity. The scriptures don't talk a lot about what this judgment looks like, so we're not going to go much further into that right now. But what I do want to call your attention to is even 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. There's a statement, uh, um, co- conflict going on in the church. And it's interesting, you know, the, the cool catchphrase in culture now is, you ain't supposed to judge nobody, right? That's everybody. You, ain't, you, you should not judge unless you be judged. So people say that all the time, right? And it's all out of context because the whole point of when Jesus says it is take the whole plank out of your eye so that you can judge faithfully. Not that you never judge. But that you actually take the plank out so you can do it carefully when you do it. But nobody reads the rest of the passage anyway, right? And it doesn't make for a good tattoo to get the whole passage. Anyway, <clears throat> so on the other side of this, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, what, like, what business do we have judging the outside? Like, God will judge them. In the church, we are supposed to judge one another. We're supposed to hold one another accountable. Encourage, build up, edify, disciple, and when necessary, discipline even in the church. Paul says this is the assumption but in the midst of this argument in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, he says, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? So again, there's not a lot here. I'm not going to go too far down this. But in some way, shape, or form, as small kings and small queens underneath King Jesus, we will rule this new world with him. 
C.S. Lewis captures this beautifully in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe with King Peter and uh, King Edmund and Queen Lucy and Queen Susan underneath King Aslan. There's a picture, as we see in Scripture, that as the people of God, we're little kings, little queens, and we're going to rule with him in his new world. This is, we're co-heirs with Christ. This is unbelievable. This is a promise Christ says to his disciples, and then again, by implication, in a much smaller and different way, to Christians. We will rule with our king. <clears throat> Verse 29, he goes on and addresses all who lose anything or anyone for his name's sake, meaning for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of his glory. Look at verse 29. Anyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake, not for promotion, <laughs> not leaving one house for a big one, right? No, Le anyone who's left family member or home or, or passed behind for my name's sake, for the sake of Christ and his gospel, will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. Promise number three I want you to bask in. You will gain immeasurably more than you could possibly lose. This is a promise for you if you're a Christian. You will gain immeasurably more than you could possibly lose. That, take it to the bank. That's going to happen. No matter what you leave behind, you will gain more. We may appear to be losers now, but that's not the case in the long run. We might look like losers now, but in the long run, hundredfold. This doesn't, he doesn't mean hundredfold literally, like literally 100 times. It's just a phrase we'd use like a lot. <laughs> like you can't even imagine what you will gain as you leave other things behind. To, to follow Christ might mean being ostracized by your family. That really might be the cost. Christ might call you to come to himself and your family say, if you're going to live like that, if you're going to be a Christian, get out of our family. That happens. I sat at Wingate University in a Bible study with a Hindu having a conversation. He looked me dead in my eyes and he said to me, Clint, do you understand if I pray to receive Christ right now and follow what you're teaching me, which I think is true, that my family will cut me off and I don't know how I'm going to pay for college or school or rent tomorrow. So he understood there's a cost. I might lose everything should I follow Christ. And like the rich young ruler, he, he couldn't do it. He walked away sad. But what the promise right here is whatever you have to turn away. You might be ostracized by your family. But when you follow Christ, you get the family of God. You might lose your mother and father. When you follow Christ, you get his multi-ethnic, multi-generational, multi-social, multi-cultural, multi-socio-economical family of God. You got all kind of fathers in the faith. You might lose mom and dad or brother and sister or son or daughter, but you will gain all of God's people. You get God as Father, you get His family as your family. Whatever you leave behind. And this is why I think about all the times we talk about the summer, hospitality. Christians skip over hospitality in the Bible like it's not a big deal. First, Peter, or First Timothy 3, a pastor must be hospitable. If he's not hospitable, he's disqualified from being a pastor. So we normally would say if a pastor cheated on his wife, he shouldn't be a pastor anymore. He's disqualified. How many people would ask the question, if a pastor is not hospitable, he shouldn't be a pastor anymore? It's in the same list. If he doesn't welcome strangers into his home, why do you think we're supposed to do this? Jesus says, if you leave behind homes and family, don't worry. Our homes and our families now, your homes and your family, we got you. No matter what you leave behind, there's immeasurably more than you could ever lose in the kingdom of God. And this is the promise for Christians. This is what led, led David Livingston to, to say what he said. I made no sacrifice. Sure, I left my earthly family his wife ended up very, very sickly, dying of malaria. He suffered greatly. Yet he would say, I made no sacrifice. Why? Because he understood this. He understood. Anyone who's left behind, mothers, brothers, sisters, fathers, sons, daughters, homes, hundredfold. Mark and Luke will say, in this life and the life to come. Many of you, I've been having conversations, great conversation with Teresa Britton, a member of our church. Somebody's talking to her. She's been ministering to somebody in the, in the community. She's reaching out, trying to love on them. And they're like, man, I, I, what's this? I just don't get what y'all are doing. She's like, well, I don't have many family members. But now that I'm in Christ and I'm a member of this church, I realize I got more family than I know what to do with. I don't even know all my family members. That's true. This is biblical. This is what Christ is saying. You get immeasurably more than you could ever lose. This is the third promise for the Christian. And then lastly, fourthly, promise. You will inherit eternal life. You inherit eternal, Christ is the key to eternal life. 
To repent of sins, to follow Jesus, to come to Jesus with childlike faith is to inherit eternal life. What an inheritance. Death poses no threat to you. No threat to you if you're Christian. If you're in Christ, there's no need for you to fear death. It's okay to fear the pain of death and to fear some of the sadness because we're in a broken world. But theologically, it makes no sense for you to fear death because you inherit eternal life. This is why Paul would say to live is Christ, to die is gain. Because all of these promises that I'm trusting by faith now become reality when I die. With my eyes, I see them. No longer do I trust with the eyes of my heart. I see with the eyes in my dome piece. <laughs> like I get to lay my eyes on these promises. And so you inherit eternal life. There's no need to fear death. To live as Christ, to die as gain. No suffering. It's paradise with God when we die. Now, Jesus summarizes this, verse 30. In this brackets, this is the reason we're, uh, we're covering all these verses together. Verse 30, there's this little proverbial statement, this little proverb that Jesus says. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. So again, Jesus gives this little proverb that serves as a gentle rebuke and then leads into this parable that does the same thing. So what he's saying is those who, who, for, who live for his namesake, those who follow Jesus, they can look like losers in this life. They can be those who would be pitied in this life. They look like last right now, but from heaven's point of view, first. So it, there might be plenty of Christians among us who feel like I'm a nobody. I don't, I don't do anything impressive, but you faithfully walk with your God. You faithfully show up in your eight to five. You faithfully love your wife and kids. You faithfully point them to the Lord Jesus. You're on your knees praying for them. And Jesus says, in the end, it's all going to shake out. Those who appear like the rich young ruler to be first in this life, who had treasures in this life, will be exposed to be last. Those who look like foolish losers in this life, like Paul running around banking and trusting that the church would take care of him. And, where he, and even in that, he said, I'll be a tent maker so that nobody has to. But people who look foolish like losers, believing in some guy who died coming back on a horse in the sky, those people who appear to be last will be first. So this is the, the, this gentle rebuke. Jesus is saying, hey, you got your mind thinking worldly. You think bigger is better. You think more people equals more blessed. You think somehow that means highly favored. You've got your mind set on the things of the world. First will be last, last will be first. The way Jesus does things, we will be shocked who are the heroes in the faith. And this is his promise. And so then he moves on into this parable. And Jesus knows about these great promises. Even the faithful disciple of Christ can, can suddenly and, and be snuck up by this attack of pride. Because suddenly it's like, that's right, these are my promises. I do have a new world coming for me where Jesus is on the throne. I will rule with this king underneath him somehow. And again, we don't like quite sure, but I will. I'm going to inherit eternal life and I'm going to gain immeasurably more than I ever lost. And so suddenly, subtly, you can begin to think somehow you contributed to that. Like Jesus looked at you and was like, man, that guy would make a really good Christian, so I'll save him and make him a Christian. Subtly, it's just these little bits of pride in us that think somehow we contributed to those promises. And so Jesus goes into this parable and reminds us to bank on his grace. You cannot bask on these promises if you're not banking on his grace. You can't do it because you think subtly you contributed to the promises. When you realize I contributed nothing but all grace did, then it makes you bask and enjoy the promises at a completely different level. So second and final point, only two today, sorry. Bank on his grace. So Jesus goes into this parable, and I'm just going to read through it and kind of make some comments and summarize it at the end. Chapter 20, verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like, so he goes into this parable about the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. Now, common work day in this culture would have been about 6 a.m. to about 6 p.m., 12-hour work day, sunrise to sunset. That would have been the normal work day. And so there's going to be hours and times where you're like, what does that mean? Six to six, 12-hour work day. And so first thing we come up, there's, there's a, um, a farmer, a master, house owner. And what would happen is there's day laborers who would go into the marketplace. They would gather in the marketplace hoping that somebody would come find them and put them to work so that they could eat. And so they depended daily on enough work to be able to survive. So it was a day-to-day 
minute by minute, hoping you could get work. And so you go to the marketplace and hope that some master of some house would come put you to work. And this master of a massive vineyard comes to the marketplace and he hires some workers and he agrees with them for a denarius a day. Now that was a common day's pay. I think it was equivalent to about a penny, I I think-ish. Scott could correct me if I'm wrong. But it it wasn't a whole lot of money, but that was the equivalent to a day's worth of work, all right? So this was the expected amount of money to get paid. So this was minimum wage for 12 hours worth of work, all right? So this this is the agreement. So he grabs some workers, and he puts them to work. He sends them into the vineyard. And then at verse 3, we'll see about 9 o'clock in the morning, the master of the house goes out again. So from 6 to 9, this original group of of workers is working. Then about 9 a.m., the master of the house goes out again. Look at verse 3. And going on about the third hour, so again, 6, 7, 8, 9, third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. So 9 o'clock in the morning, there's still still workers standing idle. They're, They're not working. They're just standing there. And he goes out and notices, you're idle. You're doing nothing. So one, that means you might be able to eat. Two, you're you're not contributing to society. You're just being lazy and standing in the marketplace, idle with nothing to do. And so he wants to give them something to do. Verse 4, and to them he said, you go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. So notice the first group at 6 a.m., they agreed a denarius. The second group coming in at 9 agrees to whatever's right. And so they trust the master is going to pay them whatever's right for the amount of work they're going to do. Verse 5 goes on. Going on about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. So at lunchtime, then again at 3 o'clock p.m., he made the same arrangement with even more workers. So again, you got the group that started at 6 a.m., a group that started at 9 a.m., a group that starts at lunch, and then a group that starts at 3 p.m. And with the 9 a.m., lunchtime, 3 p.m. group, they just agree, I'll pay you what's right. So this is the interaction. That's what's going on in the vineyard. And then verse 6 is where it gets tricky. (laughs) And about the 11th hour, he went out and found others standing and said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? So it's about five o'clock. People clock out at six, all right? They shut her down. (laughs) Six o'clock. He goes to the marketplace at five and he says, why do you stand idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. So one hour before clocking out, he hired some more workers who've stood around for 11 hours Just standing in the marketplace for 11 hours, he goes and hires them one hour's worth of work. And this time he doesn't mention pay. Let him talk about it. I would imagine at that point, you're like, it's 5 o'clock. This brother ain't going to pay me nothing. He's going to make me work and tell me to come back tomorrow. Maybe he'll pay me tomorrow. But this is, he doesn't say there's no agreement, but they go out to the vineyard to work. Then verse 8. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages beginning with the last up to the first. Now, let me give you a little hermeneutical lesson real quick. Hermeneutics, science of Bible study. How do you study the Bible rightly? When we're reading a parable, an error a lot of times people make when they're interpreting a parable and interpret it all jacked up kind of ways is suddenly you try to make everything in the parable symbolic of something. And so you can read through this in church history, people making parables mean all kind of crazy stuff. In a parable, there's usually one point There might be two or three in some circumstances, but a parable is meant to convey one thing. It's an illustration to get you to get one point, something central to a teaching. So we don't need to go uh, attributing and making everything metaphorical for something else. There's one point. And when we get to this last phrase, beginning with the last up to the first, something in our minds should connect. Wait a minute. Do you remember the last sentence in chapter 19, verse 30? Look at that again. Many who are first will be last, and the last first. Look down, chapter 20, verse 16. The last will be first, the first will be last. And so in this parable, he said, go out about the last hour. Those guys go work. Then now he tells his foreman, I want you to settle up with them. I want you to pay them. But I want you to get those who went last first. And so now we should be clicking in. Okay, the point of the parable is coming. Let's figure out what he's going to do with it. What's he trying to teach us? Verse 9. And when those hired about the 11th hour came, each of them received a denarius. This is shocking. They only worked one hour and got paid for 12. It's like, yo, that's the job I want, (laughs) right? They worked one hour and got paid for a whole day's worth. Five to six in the evening when it was getting dark, the easiest hour they worked. And yet they get paid for a whole day. This is overwhelming amount of generosity from the master of the house. This is a breathtaking amount of generosity from the master of the house to give them a whole day's pay for only one hour's work. Now, however, remember, 
Those people got paid first, which what does that mean? That means those who work the longest are standing around watching this interaction. I'm like, hold up, hold up, hold up. <laughs> He's getting how much? He's getting a whole day's worth of pay for an hour. And so you know they're like behind the scenes like, yo, we're about to get, we're about to get extra. Surely he's going to give us at least two denarius. Like surely, right? If he paid them that for just one hour and we work 12 times more than them, I mean, we're about to get paid. Right? That's what you're thinking. That's what they're thinking is they gather around and watch the last get paid first. <clears throat> what do you think they're expecting? More money. Verse 10. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. Uh-oh. This is not what they're looking for. They're thinking we work 12 times longer, and you're giving us the same thing you gave to the guys or girls that worked for an hour? So what, what, what do they do at this point? What would you do at this point? Grumbling might be putting it kind, what you would do. I know some of y'all. <laughs> you do more than grumbling. <clears throat> So, but this is what we see, verse 11. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, these last worked only one hour, and you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. So they complain, they grumble, they're frustrated. You made them equal to us. You brought them up to our level. You brought them up to us. Notice, they don't say, you brought us down to their level. It's like, no, no, I'm angry at you because you brought them up to us. We deserve more than them, is what they're saying. They're not saying you didn't pay us what we deserve. They're saying we deserve more than them. And we're starting to get close to the point of the parable. Because suddenly they're saying, wait a minute, what I've done is more impressive than what they've done. I should get more than them. I'm not even talking about what you and I have agreed to. I'm just talking about me compared to them. I'm better than them. Give me more than them. That's the interaction that's going on right here. Their anger is not an injustice of the man towards them but they're angry at his generosity to others. That's what they're angry about. He's not been unjust towards them. He's just been extremely generous to the others. That's what makes them angry. This is classic elder brother syndrome. Luke 15, the prodigal goes away and lives it up. Parties, acts like a fool. Loses all the inheritance, comes home, throws a party. The elder brother's angry. So the father meets him, throws a robe on him, ring, shoes on his feet, kill the fattened calf. He was lost. Now he's found. He was dead. Now he's alive. Let's party. And the elder brother's like, why are you throwing a party for him? I've been the good one. So he's not mad because the father's mistreating him. He's mad because the father's giving much generosity that's undeserved and grace to the younger brother. And so this parable is displaying elder brothers hate grace. We don't like it because we want to think we did something to earn it. And this is the whole point that the rich young ruler was displaying. What good deed must I do? And then Jesus says, it's impossible for you to do good enough deed to get into heaven. And we understand Christ died to get anybody into heaven. That's how God makes the impossible possible, by God dying and resurrecting and coming back to life. And then you can repent and believe and have life in his name. But then Peter says, but wait a minute. What's our reward? And Jesus says, let me blow your mind with some breathtaking promises. But let me remind you, you didn't earn one of them. Those promises that you need to bask in, you earned nothing of. You can only bask in the promises of God when you're banking on the grace of God. The man highlights this in verse 13. He replied to one of them, friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I chose to give to the last workers I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? Friends, this is a rebuke for the God of the universe to Americans who think we're supposed to be at the center of the universe. We think we're at the center of our world. And he says, he reminds, hey, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Who's God in this conversation? Am I not right to do what I want to with what I have and give to whom I want to give, how much I want to give to them without, never mind of anything of what you have to say about this? Though I've been gracious to you. Now, this, none of this parable is teaching you work or not earn anything. The point is displaying. I've been gracious to you. I want to be gracious to them. I am the one who dispenses grace. It's up to me how that happens. Who are you, O oh man, to question God? This is the shock, in fact, uh, shock factor and point of the parable. 
The master says he gives what belongs to him to whom he chooses to give it to. And there's no injustice if he wants to be more generous to some than to others. Because he's the master who's giving his money to whom he will. Think about this. Who paid the cost of the master's generosity? Who did it hurt for him to be generous to those people? Him. His pocketbook. Friend, who does it cost for God to be generous to anybody? The death of his son. God is the one who pays the penalty for your sins. God is the one who gives you the riches of his righteousness by sending his son to live a perfect life that earned heaven. He earned the reward. You earned destruction. And at his expense, he purchases the reward for you and takes your punishment for you in your place. This master can do what he wants with his grace because it's his grace. We did nothing to earn it. This is what this parable is displaying. It's the grace of the master towards all sinners. No matter what your story is, he's the one who paid the cost of his generosity. Now, some try to make this parable a parable about Israel and the Gentiles. And so they want to say the first groups are Israel and then the 11th hour people are the Gentiles. And so that was all about Israel getting in. They thought they earned their way in. The Gentiles get in in the 11th hour. Other people want to try to make this parable again about well, some people get saved when they're three years old and then some when they're teenagers and some when they're young adults and then some at the 11th hour right before they die. I think it's possible there could be some things here, but we do not need to press this parable because it's not the point. And again, a parable's got one point. We don't need to press it. God's sovereign grace is displayed however God deems it appropriate to be displayed. That's the point. God is sovereign over his grace and he dispenses it as he will because he's God and that's right and that's true and we have nothing to do with us getting those promises. The work we put in does not get those promises to us. The work he put in gets those promises to us. Christ is the hero for the 6 a.m. worker or for the 11 p.m. or 5 p.m. worker. Christ is the hero. Christ's grace to us is why we get the promises of God. So may we not be those who begrudge his generosity to great sinners. This is the good news of the gospel. Our sin, you can't sin a sin big enough that the grace of God can't save you. He's a generous master. So flee to him, repent to him, run to him. No matter 11th hour or third, you know, uh, whatever hour, first hour, Run to Christ. This is the point. God is sovereign in his dispensing of his grace and mercy. And you are hearing the grace and mercy of God through his word. So you have an invitation to respond to him even now. Run to him. He's full of grace and mercy. May we not, and make Christians, may we not be those who begrudge his generosity to great sinners. Because we can get angry. Like, hold up, God. Why you bless them? Like, I'm supposed to be blessed and highly favored, whatever that means unbiblically. Because this is all kind of jacked up, right? Highly favored means God doesn't crush me. Because nobody in the room wants justice. If you got justice, you would be in hell right now. Every person in the room. If you want justice, that's what you get. Everybody in the room wants grace. Everybody in the room needs grace. Everybody on the planet needs grace. And so we come to him, the one who dispenses that grace, no matter what the hour. And as Christians, anytime that happens with somebody else, we celebrate. Because what was once lost is now found. What was what's dead is now alive. Who cares what they've done? Because it doesn't matter what I've done. I didn't earn the way in. They can't earn the way in. But Christ got us both in. That's now family. This is the good news of the gospel. This is what it does. It unites us together in grace. Because all suddenly the church is now a hospital for sinners who realize we're all banking on grace. It's like, how, how many poker chips you got? All right, here's how many I got. Let's all put it on grace. Let's all just push all of our chips in on grace. That's who a, a church is. A bunch of people who are banking on the very grace of God. So as we bank on that grace, let's just remind you. Bank on grace so you can bask in the fact that you'll live in a new world where Jesus is seated on the throne. Bank on grace so that you can bask in the promise that you'll rule with the king in that new world. Bank on grace so that you can Bask in the promise that you will gain immeasurably more than you could possibly lose. And bank on his grace so you can bask in the fact that you will inherit eternal life. We have done nothing to earn this. We're all banking on his grace. Why would we begrudge his generosity to others? This is Paul's language in Romans chapter 9. 
And this is a very difficult chapter. I'm not going to get into all of it. But this is the language. Friends, it puts us in a right place of submission to God's mercy. Romans chapter 9, verse 14, Paul says, What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy. I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I've raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills. He hardens whomever he wills. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? When we understand this God is the one who gives us grace, we bow to our knees and say, God, give me grace and give your grace to every other human being that I can get your grace to. This is the right posture of the person who understands God's redeeming grace. I want it to go to everybody. I don't begrudge his generosity. I bask in his promises that become because of his grace, and I try to take that to as many human beings on the planet as God would let me do. This is what grace does. Jesus brackets in the parable with the reverse order of what he said. So again, look at chapter 20, verse 16. So the last will be first and the first last. For the Christian, there's no room for pride and there's no need for despair because it all graces out in the end. So instead of saying it all works out in the end, for the Christian, there's no room for pride. You have nothing to be proud of, but there's no room for despair. You have nothing to fear. It all graces out in the end. The first will be last. The last will be first. We'll find out who actually was banking all on grace and who God used. And it might be the least of these people who we think, no, we don't even know their names. And we get to heaven, we find out God used them in ways we could never imagine. The first will be last. The last will be first. And we will all glory in God's good work and how he did that. It all graces out in the end. So in conclusion, we can bask in his breathtaking promises to us because we are banking on his grace. You you can bask in his promises when you bank on his grace. So my question to you this morning as we wrap up, are you banking on his grace? Are you banking on his grace plus your goodness or his grace alone? And are you basking in his promises? Are you just resting and enjoying the fact that you know your future? You know your end. Or are you begrudging his generosity? Where's your heart? Turn to the Lord this morning. If you're not a Christian, run to him. He's full of grace. Turn from your sin. Turn to Christ. Come to him. If you are a Christian, don't begrudge his generosity. Bask in his grace. Bask in his promises and take his grace to others. Let's pray. Father God, what is man that you are mindful of us? Who are we to question you? Here's what we know. Jesus loves us, for the Bible tells me so. And with childlike faith, we trust in Christ's love. You are the God who gives forth mercy. It is mercy and grace that we can sit and hear the word preached this morning. There are Christians all over the globe who cannot even do this. And so, God, we just, as Christians in the room, proclaim to you, we're banking on grace and grace alone to save us. Grace through faith in Christ alone. Jesus, you did it all. We contributed nothing but our sin. You contributed total righteousness for us, and so we turn from our sin. We trust in you you alone. We're banking on your grace, and we are overwhelmed with the promises you give. Help us just respond and worship you in response faithfully to this good news that we know we have a new world. This place is not our home. In that world, you're seated on the throne, that we're even there with you now by faith so that you might show us the immeasurable richness of your grace and kindness towards us forever. That's our destiny, to be lavished in the riches of your grace forever. May we just bask in that. May that change how we live. May that change our anxiety. May that change what we're worried about. May that change how we prioritize what we spend our money on. May that change how we do everything because we know we are known and loved by God and that will continue forever. And God, we pray for those who don't know you this morning. They'd be blown away that your generosity is so shocking you would take great sinners even at the last minute. I pray they wouldn't abuse that grace though and put it off. I pray they repent and believe today. It would come to you. Jesus, we pray you get the glory that you do. We just proclaim to you now you're worthy. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen.